Masuri attracts and bewitches you with her ample graces. Here in this hill station, life moves on at a steady pace with the myriad activities of a small town. If you were to take the road to the outskirts, life comes to a standstill. Park Estate stands quiet and desolate, unlike the man who inhabited it. More than a century and a half ago, this place must have resounded with the spirit of a man who spent a lifetime away from his birth country, shaping the instruments and planning the charts that laid the foundation for mapping this huge subcontinent. There are mountains and mountains. In Nepal stands one that looks down upon all others. When the tallest mountain was discovered, it was named after this bushy bearded man who was so married to his cause that he walked down the aisle only on retirement. He was Sir George Everest, who was born 200 years ago. If the Everest, tall, lofty, and seemingly unconquerable, excites mountaineers, the name George Everest conjures up the adventure and challenge of mapping in India. In Dune today, stands a museum which contains evidence of the work left behind by this man who completed the great trigonometrical survey of India, south to north and east to west, and was Surveyor General of India from 1830 to 1843. Everest was diligent as he was creative. He came to India in 1806 when he was only 16. Despite periodic bouts of ailment and near paralysis, he stayed on to complete his mission of mapping this vast country. Everest combined geological and archaeological work with that of surveying India. He collected stones, shells, coins, fragments of pottery, all of which are housed in the Surveys Museum in Dehradun. The museum contains instruments used by the early stalwarts, Lambton, Everest, Rennell, and Walk. The oldest half anna stamp of India, printed in Calcutta, is also among the treasures of the museum. But Everest's primary interest was mapping. In this dilapidated building, Park Estate, at the Hathi Kapau High Point in Missouri, from where he did his surveys. On his bicentenary, the Garwal Mandal is planning to convert the area into a tourist attraction. His ancient home will be converted into a museum of the Survey of India. The history of the Survey of India is as exhilarating as the story of George Everest. In this oldest department of science and technology in India, slowly over the years, a mass of instruments and equipment was collected to make mapping more accurate. Hills, mountains, ocean depths, deserts, and forests were measured. An array of maps was prepared of different scales. But it is the people themselves who gave character to the survey. Survey of India is the oldest scientific department in the whole world. We trace our history back to the appointment of Major James Rennell as the Surveyor General of Bengal on the 1st of January 1767. That's about 223 years back. Major James Rennell was commissioned by a historian and by Lord Clive to make a map of Bengal and his map of Bengal and of that of India are famous treasures today. Thereafter, we have Cloud Martin. He was one of the surveyors of uh, James Rennell. And uh, today, you may be knowing the La Martinia schools. Well, he was the founder of the La Martinia schools. And then we come to Sir George Everest. Now, Sir George Everest took over from Lambton, the great trigonometrical surveys. Lambton was commissioned 
to do the geodetic network for India. And he started his geodetic work on a network series. Sir George Everest, whose birth bicentenary we celebrate, he was born on 4th of July 1790, was a genius, a father of Indian geodesy, and a man of great will. To him is attributed the great meridional arc of India, which he surveyed right from Cape Comoran to the foothills of the great Himalayas, a distance of about 2,400 kilometers. It is the greatest meridional arc measured in the world. This work of science and geodesy is attributed to this genius, Sir George Everest. He also introduced in geodetic surveys the grid iron method of surveys, definite chains of the zero or order precision network, which is the foundation of any modern survey. And uh, for his uh, this uh, work in the survey of India, this great scientific work, the highest peak in the world, the Mount Everest, was named after him. And uh, people say, we have put him nearest to the heavens because it is the highest point on, the f on Earth. Among the Indians who made invaluable contribution to the early mapping of India are Kishan Singh, Pandit Nain Singh, and Kin Thup. All three were explorers who set off to Tibet, dressed as lamas, with beads in one hand and the prayer wheel in the other. They walked 1,200 kilometers into Tibet, placing one foot in front of another in carefully calibrated footsteps. The data collected was stored in the prayer wheel. But the top job of Surveyor General was still with the British. It was only in 1956 that Brigadier Gambhir Singh was given this job. It is man's curiosity to probe, to look beyond his immediate environs that led to mapping. From times immemorial, you know, man has always been curious about his environment. He wants to know where he lives. He wants to know what is beyond that hill. He wants to know what is beyond the beyond. He, he wants to know where are his rivers. He, he wants to know where are his cultivable lands, where are his forests. He wants to know where he can go to mine iron, copper, Z, link. So for all this, man made maps, but in his imagination. In India also, maps were told from word of mouth, from father to son, from warrior to warrior. He was informed that if he goes from Delhi to the south, he will come across so many jungles and then after so many days march or so many coasts, he will come across a river, a mighty river where he'll need a ferry so that he can uh, go from one place to another. So today, maps have become fundamental to defense, development and efficient administration because we need to know what are our resources? Where are they? How are they placed in the environment? How are they placed to each other? Supposing I have a resource in place A. What is it that feeds the resource? What is it that is the environment around the resource? Are there any telegraph telephone lines nearby? Are there roads? Are there railway lines? How I can make bridges? What are the rivers there? So, map is a very essential commodity today for the planner, for rural development. Now, in our maps, say on the scale of 1 is to 50,000, about 5,000 sheets cover the whole of the country. And the whole of 
India is mapped on scale 1 is to 50,000. In these sheets, every village is shown. Post office, telegraph office, telephone lines, telegraph lines, power lines, roads, tracks, wastelands, cultivated areas, land use. You name it, you got it. That means you can analyze a map, you can find out whether an area is developed, underdeveloped. What are the needs of that village? What are the needs of those groups of villages? What is the habitation? What is the need of the habitation? What is the primary uh, function? What is the primary profession of that uh, village or, or that group of villages? All this can be come out from that. So for rural development or for any development, maps are very, very essential. They bring to you the earth on your table. But all this work on the harsh terrain tells on the life of the surveyor. Rennell, Lambton and Everest suffered greatly and Lambton died on an expedition. But it is also a life of great adventure. For the mapping of hills and mountains, he has to lug heavy equipment uphill and mount them precariously on perches. Surveying has come a long way since the early days Along with the excitement and the adventure, there still lurks danger. To me, a surveyor lives next to nature. And uh, he is a person who sees the country. By I meaning sees the country, I don't mean that well he sees Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, Sirinagar, Shillong. Well, he sees those places. But he has got to go to survey every inch of that land. And in surveying every inch of that land, he comes very close to nature. He comes very close to the people. And he comes to know his country and the topography of the country. For instance, I have surveyed in Rajasthan, where I had to march nearly two days just to get water. I have surveyed in the high hills of the Himalayas and uh, I put my triangulation stations at many peaks above 18,000. But the most I remember is the day I put my instrument on a peak of 19,600 feet. Well, that's not the highest. Surveyors in India have surveyed right up to 22,000 feet and put their ins instruments thereon. Then I've come in contact with tribes in Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Mizoram, Meghalaya, Tripura. And there you come to know the people, you come to know their ways, their customs, and you come to appreciate them, you come to know them. And it's quite different from knowing from people or reading in books. You come to know their warm hearts. You come to know their reasoning and what do they feel? What, the, what are the aspirations? What do they lack in? What do they want? So to me, the life of a surveyor is full of excitement, adventure. You know, I remember one thing. In one of my uh, high hill surveys, we were going and uh, there was a local. We normally engage locals because he's a little bit more familiar with the lay of the land. And uh, he advised me, okay, sir, let us cross this snow bridge. Why go across the whole way up the glacier and then come down? There was a snow bridge. That means a bridge of snow over a rivulet, which could not be forded through. And he threw a big stone onto the snow bridge and the snow bridge held. So he said, sir, it's quite safe. And when he went across, well, his body could not be found because he went through a hole. So a little bit of risk element is always there. We have lost some surveyors in avalanches. We have lost surveyors in, in the jungles. We have had casualties because of animals. I, but then these are the adventures of life. These are the risks in life. And one has to be careful about them. There are new challenges on the horizon. With limited land and natural resources and India's population increasing at an astonishing pace, the survey has a greater role to play 
in protecting the environment, improving agricultural outputs, and providing the backup for industry. In 1947 came independence and new challenges for the survey of India. The scenario in 47 was that about 60% of the area was rigorously surveyed on one inch is equal to one mile. And 40% of the area was covered by exploratory surveys, by sketch surveys, route surveys, which were not so very accurate. And those areas were the Great Himalayas, Rajasthan, and the northeastern region. The tough areas were left behind. So to me, and to Survey of India, this was a big challenge. Another challenge came, was development and the five-year plans. With the five-year plans and the thrust on development, multi-purpose projects, agriculture, industry, nearly 60 to 70 percent of our potential was diverted or utilized for developmental projects and developmental surveys. So, keeping abreast with our topographical series became a very difficult task. However, another milestone was in 1967, I think, when India went metric and we had to convert to metric system and uh, we pro started producing the maps on scales 1 is to 50,000 and 1 is to 250,000. We converted all our surveys and it was a couple of years back that India had a feather in its cap in that it covered the whole country on scale 1 is to 50,000 rigorous surveys. Many countries in the world, I mean, I'm talking about the larger countries, USSR, Canada, America, Australia, do not have a complete coverage of their countries on 1 is to 50,000 scale. Till recently, I do not of today, but for the last one or two years, the whole country was not covered. And here, a developing country, India, has this great resource available to its planners and administrators. Another challenge was manpower. So we created our survey training institute in Hyderabad to train our own people, to train surveyors. Survey of India has always been alive to changing technologies. As far back as the year 1800, we have been using the perambulator for measuring distances and vernier theodolites, various vernier theodolites, the 18-inch and then later on the 36-inch vernier theodolite for measuring angles. Simply put, surveying is nothing else but measuring distances and angles. Of course, we measure other things also together with this, that is temperature, pressure, gravity, geomagnetism. But the basic things are yeah, angles and distances. George Everest brought in the compensation bars. These compensation bars were very, very accurate for measuring distances. And he used these uh, Colby's compensation bars for measuring the bases, the six bases in the great Madrunel arc. The northern base, which is laid out in uh, Dehradun, the east end and the west end, separated by about eight miles. He was very, very meticulous in the measurement of these bases. The foundations of procedures laid down by Everest were the real foundations of what Survey of India stands on today. Then, the other milestone in development, in changing technology, was the establishment of our own printing press in Calcutta, way back in 1823. And it may not be well known, Survey of India printed the first postage stamp in India in 1854. Things have changed now. We have modern printing presses, which run at about 5,000 to 8,000 revolutions. Revolutions.
per minute, which are two color and four color impressions, which are small, which are very big for our big maps and charts. Then with changing technology, we adopted photogrammetry in a big way. It all started in 60s. And today, Service India has about over 150 precise photogrammetric instruments. With the help of these photogrammetric instruments, we plot contours and details with the help of aerial photographs which are placed on the left and right hand side cameras of the instruments. And uh, it is with the help of uh, these photogrammetric surveys that we completed most of the challenging parts of the Himalayas. But for surveying, we have to go to the ground. Though we may use aerial photographs, remote sensing, but to find out the exact distances, to find out coordinates of points, to find out names, perennialty of streams, whether they, in this building there is a post office or a telegraph office, or is, is, is it a rest house or is it a temple? What are the people, what are the tribes living in that area? All this information, the topology has to be picked up on the ground and one has again to traverse every inch of the ground to cover it systematically and completely. Then later stage in 70s, we brought in the EDM instruments for precise measurement of distances with the help of these electromagnetic magnetic distance measuring equipment. We brought in the microgravity meters for gravity measurements, the proton magnetometers for geomagnetic elements. We brought in the sophisticated glass arc theodolites for astronomical observations. And very recently, say about seven, eight years back, we adopted satellite geodesy. And now we are on to the GPS system, the global positioning system of determining the latitude, longitude and the height of a place. We are not lacking behind in modern digital cartography and we have established two modern digital cartographic centers. We hope to capture the survey data on digital tapes, on theme specific layers. You'll ask me why. To me, the creation of these digital cartographic databases will go a long way towards the development of the country. These will be required to be disseminated to the various users like the Geological Survey of India, the Forest Survey of India, and also to the planning authorities, the district planning authorities, so that on these databases, the modern digital maps, they can put on their data, their themes, their work. These, so within another 10, 15 years, I will say, India will be an expert in exchange of cartographic data in the form of diskettes. We are trying to computerize the 1 is to 250,000 cartographic data within the next 3-4 years. And then we'll go on to the 1 is to 5,000 data and the 1 is to 25,000 data. Survey of India this year also would put its flag or foot on Antarctica. We are joining the 10th Antarctica expedition and we are also planning to carry out some surveys, some scientific experiments in this cold continent. Traditionally, the surveyor set out with a chain or a theodolite measuring distances. There was only an umbrella to protect him from the inclement weather. 
but today there is great sophistication in the techniques of surveying. Data is collected by remote sensing and distances are measured without chaining two points. Work is possible in using computers, aerial photographs and electronic instruments. It seems only appropriate that on the bicentenary of George Everest, the Survey of India should have its sights set on the 10th expedition to the Antarctica.